Hi, I'm Natalie Emmanuel from Ramsey in Fast and Furious to Missande in Game of Thrones. I've loved playing roles of women whose resourcefulness, intelligence and inner strength are pushed to the limit. And I've been inspired by women who withstood the phenomenal pressures of being a wartime leader. The history books too often will have us believe that the stories of leaders in times of war are stories of men until now. I'm proud to present War Queens, a podcast about powerful women leaders throughout the centuries and around the world. In this episode, we go back to ancient Egypt to see a little known side of its legendary last pharaoh, Cleopatra. Known to history as a seductive beauty and a devourer of men, Queen Cleopatra VII was far more than a pretty face. She was the best educated, richest and most influential woman in the world in her time. She controlled the food supply and gold that powered armies. She was a tough bargainer and relentless in protecting her children's claim to her kingdom. This goddess stateswoman was an incredibly hard worker. She was a shrewd diplomat and she spoke nine languages. Cleopatra led Egypt through the war-torn era of Julius Caesar, the fall of the Roman Republic and the rise of an empire. Here to tell you Cleopatra's story are the daughter-father history team of Emily and John Jordan. Natalie, it's great to see you in Atlanta again. Now, before we get started with our story, I wanted to ask you, as an actor yourself, who are some of the great actresses of the past that you've looked up to when you were an up-and-coming actress? Oh, wow. So many. <laughs> There's so many. It's hard to sort of list them all. But I, you know, as a sort of young you know, woman of color, like there was few of us represented in TV and film. And I think the first person that made me go, I can do this because she can do it. Is, uh, was Halle Berry. I mean, she's like phenomenal. And um, obviously there have been very many since that I have um, I highly look up to. But um, yeah, she was like the first, I think, for me. That's a great choice. Yeah. Yeah, definitely an icon. Mm -hmm. uh, one name that really resonates with Hollywood's golden age is Elizabeth Taylor, whose signature role was a woman we'll be talking about today. Uh, yeah, and that is every war queen's ultimate icon, Cleopatra of Egypt. Absolutely. She's the one. And like you said, she's known for being one of history's great seductresses, sporting an Egyptian headdress. But most people don't really realize what an extraordinary sense of leadership she brought to the table. Yeah, it's a shame that often Cleopatra is thought of as just a pretty face. Um, I think a lot of women can relate to that. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> writers from the Romans down to Shakespeare won't stop talking about what she looked like or who she slept with, yawn, but they hardly say a word about her education, her language ability, management skills, and accomplishments as a leader of one of the world's great civilizations. So let's write that wrong, John. Let's do it. Why don't you tell us about the Cleopatra not seen in the movies? Cleopatra has a reputation as being one of history's great hotties, but the reality is that she was a workaholic. She was incredibly ambitious. Mm -hmm. She had an immense appetite for knowledge and power, and she was quite a gambler. Uh, but every time we talk to people about putting Cleopatra in the book, one of the questions we get is, so what'd she look like? Was she as beautiful as, as depicted in the, in the movies? So mm -hmm. if it's okay with you, we'll get that out of the way first. Sure, sure. All right. What did she look like? Answer, we really have no clue. Mm -hmm. uh, she probably was a pretty standard Greek Macedonian stock. She hailed from a, a family called the Ptolemies, and the Ptolemies were a dynasty that was started by one of Alexander the Great's generals. And they liked to keep their family tree really tightly pruned. You had a lot of brothers, mm -hmm. sisters, cousins marrying. And so she was probably pretty standard Macedonian stock. Absolutely. Their family tree, we like to say, was a lot like a bamboo, just yeah, up and down. Absolutely. She spoke Greek. She would have married, you know, her, her ancestors married within the family. So Cleopatra probably had those pretty typical Grecian features. Medium skin, dark hair, a rather largest nose, 
uh, dark eyes, uh, and, and that's really all we know. Mm -hmm. There are some coin portraits of her and, and other depictions from ancient times, but th we don't know if they're reliable or not. In the coins, she has very Romanized features. There's mm -hmm. one of them with Mark Antony on one side and Cleopatra on the other. And basically, Cleopatra looks like Mark Antony in drag. Big, <laughs> strong chin, uh, kind of a r very Roman nose. You could say they're two sides of the same coin. Yes, very. that sounds like a dad <laughs> joke. Yeah. Um, but yes, that's absolutely true. There are also some Egyptian depictions uh, at the Temple of Hathor, for instance. She's depicted with her son. And guess what? She looks very Egyptian goddess-like. Mm -hmm. So throughout history, you know, Cleopatra looks like the way her she wanted her people to see her, whether it was as an Egyptian goddess or a, uh, a Roman uh, ally. Yeah, so if anyone tells you they know what she looks like, they're lying to they, you. They don't. But what she had going for her was that she was probably the best educated woman in the world. She lived in Alexandria, the intellectual capital of the world. That she, it was one of the most cosmopolitan cities on the planet, and she almost literally had the Great Library of Alexandria in her backyard. She was educated by royal tutors. So Plutarch, the Greek historian, claims that she could speak nine languages, including Greek, of course, but also Aramaic, Parthian, Ethiopian, and imagine this, unlike the rest of her family, she could actually speak Egyptian. I think that is an incredible thing to note, though, that so many of the rulers of this region could not even speak the language of her own people. She takes the time to learn how to communicate with them, and that really serves her amazingly later in life. So, Yeah, so, cool. she, so she had a lot of things going for her. She's educated, she's royal stock, very Brahmin class among Egyptians. Here's what she had going against her a dysfunctional family. Mm. And we see a lot of those. She had a big sis named Berenice. Uh, Berenice overthrows dad, who was named King Ptolemy. All the Ptolemies are named Ptolemy. So uh, dad had to hire the Romans to help him get his kingdom back. And so the Romans, under General Pompey the Great, who's their like number one general at the time, toss out Berenice, and then they put King Ptolemy back on the throne. Mm. So Ptolemy, uh, has his oldest daughter, Berenice, killed, Natch, and then that settled the family business for a moment. Then Ptolemy, the king, dies, and he leaves his throne to his next daughter, Cleopatra, and his uh, son named Ptolemy. So, Emily, if, if, if this would be like if I had your older sister executed for treason uh, and yes. made you and little brother the kings of the land. Naturally. Yes, naturally to some. Um, <laughs> But uh, at this time, Cleopatra was 18 years old and her younger brother, Ptolemy, was only about uh, 12 or 13, we think. And what made that so problematic is that for both of them to rule, they had to be married. They had to be what's called sibling loving gods. Yeah, the Egyptians were really into the whole brother, sister, you know, married thing. Uh, it's unclear what exactly that meant in their personal lives, but at least for public consumption, it was always nice to have a brother and sister, two sibling loving gods, and the word sibling loving gods was probably one of the saddest jokes of their lives because they were at each other's throats before too long. Mm -hmm. The sibling loving gods also had a younger sister named Arsinoe, and then baby bro, who was also named Ptolemy. If you're playing a drinking game in this episode, drink when you hear Ptolemy. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, it wasn't exactly a happy family. The bigger Ptolemy, who's, like I said, 12, 13 years old, starts plotting a palace coup against big sis Cleopatra with the help of his eunuch, a uh, guy named Potinus. Mm -hmm. he, he's kind of like the character Varys from Game of Thrones, kind of skulking around and dipping his fingers in political affairs. Yeah, although, and, and I do think that back then eunuchs were like a status symbol, like, you know, bodyguards or personal assistants are today. Mm -hmm. But uh, but unlike Varys, who was sort of concerned for the welfare of the kingdom of, as a whole, I always liked him as a character in Game of Thrones. Potinus was not that way. He was a partisan for Ptolemy. He thought that if we can uh, get rid of Cleopatra, then we're going to be able to run things, you know, more to our liking. That takes a lot of balls. So, <laughs> oh, 
Thank you. That was another <laughs> unique <dad> joke. joke. <laughs> um, so in 49 BC, uh, they plot a palace coup. Potinus, some other courtiers, and uh, and younger Ptolemy throw Cleopatra out of the country. She has to retreat for her lives with some retainers. She crosses the Sinai Desert. She goes up through the Middle East as far as Syria, and she recruits about 20,000 mercenaries. And that's a really big kind of Game of Thrones moment to me, is that made her kind of the Daenerys of this story, is that she goes through all these places with, you know, promises of money, of course, and but also her godly claim to the throne. And she is able to convince people throughout the countryside to follow her. And that is because she was able to speak nine languages. She could go and speak with these generals, speak to the people and convince them. And what does it take to be a cult-like, we'll say cult-like leader of a movement? And she had those qualities, which I, I think is fascinating. Well, the other thing about that is a lot of times we hear about kings and queens leading these armies, but we never get to hear the story of how they got those armies. Yeah. I mean, they didn't just start out there with some massive formation. In Cleopatra's case, she uh, uses her language skills. She recruits Romans, she recruits Syrians to train the soldiers. And the next year, now we're talking about 48 BC roughly, she's uh, back in Egypt. She returns with her army. She's moving toward Alexandria and her army gets stopped by an army under Ptolemy at a place called Pelusium. It's uh, sort of on the east fork, east uh, delta of the Nile. And it's still a ways from Alexandria and there's a big brick fort there. You can actually still see the ruins of, of this area today. It's been fought over for centuries. Wow, so she stopped here, but she needs to get all the way to Alexandria. Yeah, and she has to get there fast because her army can't just sit there in the desert indefinitely. They're gonna start running out of food, they're gonna start deserting, and she knows that she's got to make a play pretty quickly. So, enter JC. Jesus Christ. No, not Jesus oh. Christ. <laughs> He's not going to come around for about another, you know, four or five decades, depending on the on when you time it. Uh, here we're talking about Julius Caesar. You know, the Julius Caesar. We can call him GJC if that helps, because okay. his first name was Gaius. But he had just won Roman Civil War number one. While Cleopatra is stuck with her army outside Pelusium, Caesar shows up in Alexandria and says, I want to have a sit down with Ptolemy and uh, your sister. So we're going to talk about how you guys are going to rule Egypt. Now, Emily, when you're in an argument as a kid with your brother or sister, what's the number one rule? It is, oh, you have to get to the parent first and you have to say, um, th he hit me first. Exactly. And so Cleopatra is watching Ptolemy skirt back to Alexandria and talk to basically dad, uh, Julius Caesar, and get his side of the story out. And she knew she had to get back to Cleopatra quickly. So famous story, you know it. What does she do? Well, she has to get into the castle somehow, or not castle, but the palace somehow. And uh, like in the movie, she is carried in by a you know slave or servant. Um, it's not like in the movie with the rug where she's wrapped in it, but she gets carried in a burlap sack and snuck into the palace. Exactly. She the, needs a big entrance. Yeah. Fabulous it, reveal. So even if you're not wrapped up in a rug as they do in the movies, and I gotta say, if you're not if you're claustrophobic and you like oxygen, that's not really a great way to move around. Mm -hmm. But she still makes this big appearance, and Plutarch says that. That, uh, uh, Julius Caesar, who appreciated political theater, was entranced by somebody who would make that kind of an entrance and get past an entire army through enemy lines just to talk to him. Well, Caesar is one of those pushy house guests who shows up at the palace and kind of takes it over. He has he, that luxury when you bring an army with you. Exactly. But it was, it was a relatively small army. It was about one and a half legions that he brought, so maybe 6,000 men roughly. He takes over the palace and he tells Ptolemy, all right, you and uh, you and your big sister need to make peace. I'm going to make you the joint rulers of Egypt. That didn't sit well with Ptolemy's army, which came back from Pelusium and lays siege to Alexandria. Now you've got Caesar cooped up for months on end in this palace with mobs and fires and soldiers outside and he's stuck with this dysfunctional family of teenagers, basically. I can't imagine, have you ever been on a vacation where the friend that you're on vacation with and their family's fighting the whole time and it's so awkward? Yeah, th this was seriously awkward. And they're in this palace full of gold and you know Persian rugs and all that. 
and they're squabbling. So a younger sister, Arsinoe, manages to escape and she rallies the Egyptian army to like try to overrun the palace. And Caesar's soldiers are able to hold it, but Caesar has to go send out letters to all of his friends calling for reinforcements. And you know, while holding this palace down, uh, Cleopatra was a great help. She wasn't just sitting there pretty, she knew this is an issue. And she was all the, all the while informing Caesar about here's the weak points of the city, here's where they could get in, um, here's who we trust, here's who we don't. So she was providing some amazing intelligence over to Caesar. Exactly, because at this point, Cleopatra had worked with generals. She had helped run an army. She was not a general herself, but she knew how to manage the army. And that would become a role that she would play mm -hmm. with Caesar. Well, Ptolemy, the younger king, manages to get out of the castle and he joins the army that's besieging the palace. Uh, but eventually one of Caesar's friends shows up from the Middle East. He marches an army toward Pelusium, same old place. And so Ptolemy runs out to try to defeat that army before he can join up with Caesar. He's unable to. Caesar tells uh, Cleopatra, hold my beer, I'll be back. He dashes off to Pelusium from the other side and manages to destroy Ptolemy's army. So little brother ends up uh, on a boat in the Nile trying to get away. The boat's overcrowded with refugees and it capsizes. And when you're wearing ceremonial armor, you don't want to be in the middle of the Nile River. So he becomes alligator and fish food. And that would be the second boy king who uh, dies in the river. Yeah. So. so he goes off to meet Osiris in the next life. Cleopatra is now back in Alexandria. She's top dog with Caesar. Mm -hmm. She uh, puts baby brother Ptolemy the 14th on the throne. 14th if you're counting. Back then, <laughs> nobody counted. Um, she basically told her younger brother, you're going to be my co-ruler, but you're going to stay out of my way and keep your nose out of my business. Mm -hmm. Sit still, look pretty. Yeah. She did the usual round of executions and promotions and firings and all that other stuff you do to the organization chart when you take over and, and win a war and you become the ruler. Yep. And Routine pruning. Yeah, yeah, and so she and, and she also paid uh, Caesar a huge amount of quan, of gifts, of all kinds of stuff that he needed to pay his soldiers, and that he could take back to Rome and show everybody, look at all this stuff I captured. There's one other thing that she gave Caesar at the time. You remember what that was? Little Caesar. Little Caesar, exactly. <laughs> she of uh, the pizza chain. Yeah, Just yeah. Kidding. During that time, she became pregnant, apparently with Caesar's child, when they were cooped up in the palace with almost nothing else to do. And uh, so Caesar became the baby daddy and Egypt's protector, while Cleopatra supplied the money and the food and all the other stuff that Caesar needed. Well, Caesar goes back to Rome and Cleopatra continues to run things in Egypt for about two years. Cleopatra goes back to running the country herself. Mm -hmm. Egypt had a very tightly planned economy and that put Cleopatra in charge of doing things like of setting tariffs, setting wage rates, setting prices, things like that. Mm -hmm. It was very centrally controlled. Uh, so Cleopatra does that. She raises little Caesar for a while. Caesarian was his name, actually. <laughs> and then a couple of years later, she goes back to visit Caesar in Rome. Well, this time she's able to watch his big victory parade, which he staged for a lot of wars that he won. I love a good parade. Yeah, so. well, everybody does. Uh, she, uh, unlike in the movie Cleopatra with, with Elizabeth Taylor, she didn't show up and just like flaunt her relationship with Caesar. No. She, she was kind of discreet. The Roman crowds could be very moralistic when they wanted to be. And she uh, kind of kept a low profile by her standards. She showed up as an ally of Rome, not as Mrs. Caesar. Uh, one of the stars of the victory parade, though, was younger sister Arsinoe. Oh, no. She had gotten captured at that uh, battle near Pelusium, and uh, so Caesar had her in the parade. She was stuck in a cart, kind of like the same thing you would see, like an old-time circus, keep a tiger like in. Dumbo. In. Yeah, Dumbo. Uh, she, she, they put chains on her. She Aww. basically was there for the crowd to laugh at. And ironically, the crowd, you know, they see this, this 17 year old girl now in chains, crying her eyes out and they felt sorry for her. And so instead of strangling her, which would be the usual end to yeah, routine, yeah, routine stuff, uh, Caesar packed her off to Ephesus and uh, sent her to the temple of Artemis and said, 
I don't want to hear from you again. Sit still, look pretty. Just sit still and look pretty. So 44 BC rolls around. Now Caesar's about ready to go off to another war against Parthia, which is sort of in Iran. And a group of senators, as we know, they assassinate him. Ides of March. Ides of March, yep. That starts a new civil war with the Republicans on one side, not like the GOP, mm -hmm. but Republicans who wanted a, a republic for Rome. They were the senators versus the Caesarians. Cleopatra knows that her lover is assassinated. She lights back to Alexandria, and on the way she thinks, now I've got to pivot, and who am I going to pivot to? We've got two sides in this civil war, and both of them are going to want Egypt's gold and its grain. So what are we going to do? So Cleopatra is a survivor of assassins, a civil war with her brother, of the death of her lover, Julius Caesar. Then, with Mark Antony, she manages to mix personal and political relationships at the same time. Was it political calculation or love? She was threatened by the Republicans. She was saved at the last minute when Mark Antony and Octavian, the two Caesarian generals, defeated the Republicans at the Battle of Philippi. So in walks Antony into her life. She had probably met Antony back when she was in Rome, but at mm -hmm. this point, Mark Antony, Marcus Antonius, was at the peak of his life. He was in his early 40s. He loved fighting. He loved women. He loved power. He loved glory. Octavian controlled the western part of the Roman Empire, and Mark Antony controlled the east. Which included Cleopatra. Cleopatra, exactly. So how did she win audience with the sexiest man alive at All the right. time? So sexiest man alive is over in Turkey, and he's kind of like the HR head who comes into the office and says, I need to interview all the employees to see which ones are going to keep their jobs. He's doing that, and one of the employees he's got to interview is Cleopatra. So he tells Cleopatra, meet me at uh, Tarsus in Turkey. So Cleopatra puts him off for six months. She's not just going to come running because he said to come running. She knows how to play this game. And when she showed up, she came down a river in a fleet of party barges and was ready to strut her stuff as the world's greatest party planner. So here's how Plutarch, the Greek historian, describes her entrance. She came sailing up the river Sindus in a barge with gilded stern and outspread sails of purple, while oars of silver beat time to the music of flutes and fifes and harps. She herself lay there all along under a canopy of cloth of gold, dressed as Venus in a picture, and beautiful young boys, painted like cupids, stood on each side to fan her. Her maids were dressed like sea nymphs and graces, some steering at the rudder, others working the ropes. I love me a good fife, personally. Yeah. yeah, a good fife is, you know, that sets the mood, doesn't it's it? It's hard to come by. Yeah. Well, she makes this entrance, and she's going to start whining and dining Mark Antony and his lieutenants, and shows off her party planning skills. In her first banquet, she sets up in the middle of nowhere 12 rooms with banquet tables that are stuffed full of food on gold plates, golden jeweled goblets, had all kinds of like bling everywhere, all underneath a bunch of lamps strung from the, the trees to create kind of a starlight effect. So Mark Antony and his top lieutenants, they're eating and drinking and they're getting drunk and hung over and they start to go home and she says, wait a second, all of the gold plates, all of the gold jewels, this is all my gift to you. So that was their party pack for that night. That's what I plan to do when I get married next year is just say, everyone just take what you want. I don't want to clean up, just cart it off with you. So you're getting Beyonce to pay for your wedding? Maybe. Why would Beyonce pay for my wedding? That's my point. Okay. I'm not going to be paying for it. <laughs> um, the second banquet, uh, she forces Mark Antony and his lieutenants to wade calf deep through rose petals to get to the tables. And again, more eating, more drinking. She sends back stuff, you know, silver, horses, slaves. It's all part of gifts complimentary of the hostess. So by the end of the banquets, Cleopatra had totally won over Anthony. 
He moves in with her to Alexandria. They got married and they made themselves God and goddess of Egypt. He was Dionysus or Bacchus, and she was I the goddess Isis, or her Romanized version was Venus. And they actually made a pretty incredible pair together. You know, we, she has two big relationships in her lifetime, uh, but her and Mark Antony truly just had a, a great bond. They would go to lectures together they, in libraries, but they would also stay up late drinking and gambling. Um, they would go on to have like a very strong romantic relationship. Yeah, you, you notice with a lot of women who have been through the stress of war throughout history, they, they're not very good at family relationships. In Cleopatra's case, her first sort of husband, Julius Caesar, well, he made her a widow. But Cleopatra really seemed to stick with Anthony, and they seemed to be committed to each other. But it was also a strategic alliance between Mark Antony and the Queen of Egypt that, that bound them together. Antony was not just the baby daddy to Cleopatra's twins, they would have three ultimately, but he was also the world's best general, and he had client kingdoms and soldiers and armies running from Syria to Greece. So Cleopatra, as with Julius Caesar, would provide the funding and the ships and the equipment and the food and some of the soldiers, and the, they became the world's first great power couple. I think the first great power couple of history. Now, you know, there are some political marriages, like you say, that coincide with love and some don't. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt and FDR. It was a political marriage with some, some emotion. Hillary and Bill Clinton, debatable. But, I mean, what do you think? I mean, do you, do you think that, that love is something that uh, is a luxury that war queens historically have not been able to afford? I think absolutely, because the way history puts an emphasis on a woman's ability to have a son or what her marriage means to be a ruler, that would always be on the table for our war queens. Uh, Cleopatra probably knew that, you know, he's look, He's not just looking at her for her, her brain and her beauty, but the Nile fertile valley of uh, grains, of resources, of people and riches. And so I think it definitely adds a layer of difficulty to ever finding what could have been a really true and romantic match. And, and we'll see plenty of war queens that go through and you know, maybe they find true love, but it's it's never lasting. It's always ends up having to be political. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, the politics always is going to intrude in a relationship like Cleopatra and Anthony's. Five years into the relationship, Cleopatra, among other people, started urging Mark Antony to take care of a problem that they'd had for a long time. And this was the Parthian kingdom back in Iran. Now remember, when Caesar was assassinated, he was going to go settle things with Parthia. But it's, it's a tough kingdom to overrun. The Parthian kingdom had been harassing Mark Antony's client kings to the east. And so uh, Mark Antony decided we need to go put the hurt on the Parthians. Uh, Cleopatra said, these guys are harassing your kingdoms. Anthony knew that if he kicked butt in Parthia, then the Romans would love him. He'd been absent for the country, and this would be another great story that he could send back. And Mark Antony learned from the best about self-promotion. I mean, Julius Caesar, this guy knew how to publicize himself. Hugh Jackman in The Greatest Showman, I mean, he had nothing on Caesar, and Mark Antony wanted to emulate Caesar. Yeah, reputation was incredibly important to him. Yeah, so Mark Antony has 100,000 soldiers that he pulls together, and Cleopatra supplies him with the money, the food, the supplies, the horses, and basically everything to throw down on the Parthians. Cleopatra did her part. At this point, she's now super pregnant with Anthony's next child, and she goes off with him on the expedition as far as the Euphrates River in modern-day Iraq. And on the way back home, she's waiting for Anthony to come back, and she decided to stop in places like Jerusalem and, and other kingdoms and negotiate these trade agreements that proved that she was just an incredible negotiator and knew how to use her power with Anthony as leverage. Well. That worked fine for Cleopatra, but Mark Antony blew it. He didn't capture anything important, and the Parthians went scorched earth on him. 
So Antony had to retreat from Parthia, like Armenia, that area, and he he had to send word back to Cleopatra, hey, bail me out, I'm in trouble. It was embarrassing for him. Yeah, he had to get his wife to, to bail him out. And I mean, for a, Roma, a manly Roman like him, that was, that was not good stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Cleopatra jumped in as she always did. She sent a relief expedition with more food, more money, and more ships to bring him home. Now, the Parthians were one problem Antony and Cleopatra had, but there was another guy who was going to be an even bigger problem. By now, Rome is a hot mess, and Cleopatra is trying to keep her head above water. But she still has resources and a very powerful friend. We'll talk about how she navigates between Rome's competing factions after the break. So Antony returns a complete failure, essentially. But there's definitely a bigger foe waiting at the end of that road, Octavian. Octavian was Julius Caesar's nephew. He was Julius Caesar's heir. And under his deal with Mark Antony, Octavian got claim to the Western kingdoms, like what's now France and Spain and Mm -hmm. even little bits of Britain, uh, Germany, places like that. But they were both big rivals. They both had huge egos. And it wouldn't be long before they squared off with each other, Uh, partly because while Anthony uh, was married to Cleopatra to work this deal with Octavian, he also married Octavian's sister, Octavia. Even in this time, you can't be double married. Yeah, you only get to wear one hat at a time or one one Roman helmet at a time, I Mm -hmm. guess, Uh, at least where, where wives are concerned. So... Uh, What even made things worse from Octavian's standpoint, Antony doubled down on his in-your-face thing when he went to Alexandria with Cleopatra, his Egyptian wife. They have this big ceremony in the gymnasium in Alexandria with lots of gold and thrones, and they start giving out these territories in the east that Rome claimed to Cleopatra and Antony's kids. So... They're giving out Syria, they're giving out Cyprus, and the Romans are going, what are you doing? This is this belongs to the to the what's really an empire. Yeah. These are Roman territories. And then, top it off, Anthony starts issuing Roman coins with Cleopatra's face on them. And that really made the Romans mad. You know, these coins are gonna be in merchants' pockets and get back to Rome. And they didn't like that. That was the first time they saw a foreigner's face on one of their coins. So at this point, Antony is burning a lot of bridges back home. He was still a Roman, though. And Octavian, for political reasons, knew that he could not declare war on Mark Antony because Mark Antony had a big, uh, you know, had a past reputation. You just don't go fight another Roman. You fight foreigners. And that was the big We'll pretend that all of our civil wars are really fights against people like the Numidians and and other folks when they're not. But Octavian could declare war against Egypt and Cleopatra. And so he went on a smear campaign to paint her as this trollop, this this prostitute in, in a barbarian kingdom who had stolen away a good Roman from his good Roman wife. And they kind of got very moralistic. Like I said, sometimes the Romans get that way. So, selectively, for yeah, sure. Yeah, and they're very selectively, exactly. So uh, so now he's going to go to war against Egypt, and that meant going to war against Antony because Cleopatra and Antony, they're a package deal. Well, again, Cleopatra is basically the team's owner and general manager, and Antony was the coach and the star player. Cleopatra built a fleet of ships, and she assembled gold and weapons, and the two lovers took about 112,000 soldiers off to Western Greece so they could defend against Octavian's invasion. Well, Antony and Cleopatra had a pretty big army, but Octavian had a good navy, Mm -hmm. and he controlled the sea. So pretty soon, Octavian had isolated Antony and Cleopatra's army in Greece, and that army began running out of food. One thing we see in a lot of these stories is, you know, it's not just about what a tough fighter you are. You got to have something to eat. 
Absolutely, the supply arteries were a major factor when it came to the battlefield. That's right. Antony's generals told him, we're in an untenable position. You need to negotiate with Octavian. And by the way, probably what the price of a negotiated peace with Octavian is going to be Cleopatra's head. Throw her to the wolves. Antony wouldn't do it, though, did he? No, he wouldn't. I mean, he by her. Yeah, he did. Mark Antony had a lot of flaws, but loyalty was not one of them. So with his options running out, Antony decided that he was going to fight Octavian at sea and he was going to allow Cleopatra to escape back to Egypt with their, their treasury and all the gold that they still had for the army's payroll. Well, Antony's ships charged out from a little promontory called Actium in 31 BC. This is in Western Greece, and just like the Parthian War, it didn't go well for the Antonians. Antony's ships were outnumbered, they were picked off and destroyed, and eventually Antony and Cleopatra hightailed it for Egypt, abandoning basically 80,000 soldiers of their army who were now angry at them, abandoned, and some of them were probably going to join Octavian now. I would be upset too. I, you know, that takes away some war queen's points here. Abandoning your army is yeah. never a good look. Although it was mostly Antony's army from, yeah. a, from a branding standpoint. <laughs> we can say that. Yeah. So, but, but Cleopatra's only goal at this point is to, um, is to protect her children and protect her dynasty. So as Octavian and his army is approaching Egypt, and as Antony can't pull together a big army to stop him, Cleopatra starts sending secret letters to Octavian to try to negotiate something. And her one immutable demand was that her children had to be the rulers of Egypt. Well, obviously, Octavian wasn't going to allow that. He kept marching up to Egypt. Octavian made demands that Cleopatra give up Antony. He was going to have to send him to his death, but Cleopatra wouldn't do it. No, she stood by him just like he stood by her. Yeah, it's a stand by your man and stand by your woman package deal. Antony had been loyal to her a couple of times, and he never would betray her and she wouldn't betray him. So Octavian shows up in Alexandria. Well, we get to the final dramatic scene of her life. Mm -hmm. She shuts herself up in a big mausoleum and she has one last bargaining chip. She basically takes the entire Egyptian treasury and furniture, and gold inlaid chairs and tapestries and alabaster and stuff like that. And she puts it into this giant pile in her mausoleum covered with pitch and tar and kindling. And she basically says, I'm gonna burn this treasury to the ground if you don't let me keep my kingdom. And that would be probably the most expensive funeral pyre in all of history. Yeah. (laughs) Imagine the immense wealth of Egypt, essentially in one room. Yeah, so she piles all this stuff and she knows that Octavian needs that treasure to pay his soldiers. I remember one time uh, Julius Caesar had said that there are two things that retain power, soldiers and money. And if either of those two is lacking, then the other one's going to fall apart as well. Octavian had to have her treasure to be able to uh, continue paying his his soldiers. Uh, So we end up with uh, Antony seeing everything falling apart. Cleopatra is stuck in the mausoleum and she's getting ready to torch the Egyptian treasury. She sends out word through servants that she's dead to Antony. It's very Shakespearean at this point. It, it actually does. You know, there's there's a lot of Romeo and Juliet here. Historians think that she was trying to let him know that he could make his own deal with Octavian and he didn't have to factor her into the calculations. Well, Antony's despondent at this point. He'd been going through a lot of situational depression for the past (laughs) couple of months, and he tries to commit suicide. He tells a slave to kill him. And what does the slave do? Slave goes, I'm going to do you one better. I'm going to kill myself as emulating (laughs) your great Roman example. Oh, no. So Antony's contemplating suicide, and he knows that he's got to do it himself. So he sticks his sword under his rib cage and pulls but he botches even that. He misses his vital organs and just ends up bleeding everywhere. Then he hears that Cleopatra's not really dead. Oops. <laughs> yeah, and that's the Romeo and Juliet moment. Yeah, it, it really is. I hadn't thought about it till you mentioned it. Oh yeah, it's I probably exactly should have, that. but I had, uh, I had a, 
a, a weak uh, British literature teacher in, in Alabama. <laughs> well, Cleopatra's servants outside the mausoleum carry Anthony, who's dying now, to the mausoleum. And then they put ropes around him so that she can drop from the window so that Cleopatra can haul him up to the window on ropes and see him one last time. It, it was truly pitiful to just imagine, you know, you're doing your job, you're the servant, you drag this large warrior man up to this mausoleum. And Cleopatra, who's probably not known for her physical feats, is pulling him up to her window. And I imagine the, the tie job isn't perfect. No one's used to doing that, but it just had to be pathetic, him dripping in blood and kind of clinging to her window. Well, it's, it's funny you say pathetic and pitiful because on War Queens, we really love our sources, ancient, mm -hmm modern, whatever. And uh, so we can wrap this episode back by going back to our boy Plutarch. He wrote, never was there more a piteous sight. Smeared with blood and struggling with death, he was drawn up, stretching out his hands to her even as he dangled in the air. Scarcely could Cleopatra, with clinging hands and strained face, pull up the rope, while those below called out encouragement to her and shared her agony. Well, Anthony dies in his lover's arms and Octavian's men break in and they're able to stop any kind of fire before she can set this giant gold bong ablaze. So Cleopatra is captured. She's held in the mausoleum. She knows she's going to take Arsinoe's place in Octavian's triumphal parade back in Rome. So she takes poison and dies. And with her, the Ptolemaic dynasty dies and Rome rules Egypt. Kind of a sad ending, but we said war queens, not necessarily war winners. And to her death, a lot of people think that uh, she was bit by a snake. I think that's what happens in the movie. Um, oh yeah, all the paintings, they're showing her mm -hmm. like, you know, here and here She's holding here. a really pretty cobra or something. Um, but history tells us that it probably wouldn't have been that. It probably would not have been a snake. Uh, the Ptolemies had almost an encyclopedic knowledge of different types of venom and poisons as they use them so frequently. So uh, Cleopatra most likely uh, took a quicker acting poison that doesn't rely on the potency of the snake or a dry bite. So fun fact of history. Yeah, I mean, you, you go out to, I mean, she might as well have just walked in the woods and gotten bit by a rattlesnake if she wanted to go out that way. Mm -hmm. But uh, she did take uh, some sort of faster acting poison. She dies. End scene. So, Dad, where would you rank Cleopatra among war queens? What is your rating for her? Uh, I give her pretty high marks, and mm -hmm. here's why. First, uh, first for longevity, give her points for that, because she ruled from roughly 47 to 31 BC, so she had a nice long stretch. She was always a very good manager. She always knew, and this is a rarity for some leaders, especially men, she knew not to stick her nose into the tactics too much. You find a lot of men who become war leaders, and when war breaks out, they may have had some training in warfare, but oftentimes that's just enough to be dangerous. Cleopatra didn't have that. She knew how to negotiate. She knew how to finance. She was basically the arsenal of autocracy. So I give her points for that. I give her high points for her managerial skills, her negotiating skills. Probably slightly lower points for throwing in with Antony, mm -hmm. but you know, given what she knew back in uh, you know the 42 BC time frame, Antony was probably the better horse to go with anyway. And you know, there is love. Yeah. So total, I give her about uh, 8.5, 8.7 out of 10. Sounds good. All right, that's our story of Egypt's last pharaoh. Cleopatra's legacy is complicated. Her narrative tells us the value of hard work, education, and choosing the right friends. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of War Queens. That's our show for today. Listen to every episode of War Queens for more stories of women who brought their nations through the fires of war. any questions for us about war queens if you're curious about something you heard on the show we'd love to hear from you please email us at warqueens at diversionaudio.com 
Again, that's warqueens at diversionaudio.com. We'll try to answer your questions on a future episode. Find us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at War Queens Podcast. War Queens is a production of Diversion Audio. Your hosts are John Jordan, Emily Jordan, and I'm Natalie Emmanuel. The show is written by John and Emily Jordan based on their book, The War Queens. Our supervising producer and sound designer is Mark Francis. With production assistance from Antonio Enriquez, editorial direction from Jacob Bronstein and Scott Waxman. Our head of marketing is Erica Farmer. Our theme music is by Tyler Cash. Executive producers, Jacob Bronstein, Mark Francis, and Scott Waxman for Diversion Audio. 